Welcome once again to Monday Night in Prophecy. It is January the 8th of 2024. And, uh, you know, we didn't meet a week earlier, January 1st. That probably wouldn't have suited you and it wouldn't have suited me either. So we are, uh, we delayed it one week, January the 8th. So much has happened again in the last month, December, and uh, we're going to cover that. But before we do, let me read to you 2 Peter 3, verse 9, where we read, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So sometimes I hear the comments, why isn't the Lord coming back? Look at, look at what's happening in this world. and I'm so sick and tired of all that. I'm ready for the rapture. Well, I'm ready for the rapture too. But God has a reason why he's waiting. There are people out there that are not saved. And yet they will be saved. And God knows that. And so he, in his patience, he's waiting for them to come to him as Savior and Lord. So for their sake, we are waiting for the rapture. Nevertheless, we are told to look up because our redemption is drawing near. You know, one out of every 30 verses in the Bible mentions the subject of Christ's return or the end of times. Of the 216 chapters in the New Testament, there are well over 400 references to the return of the Lord. 23 of 27 New Testament books mention Christ's return, so almost all of them. In the Old Testament, such well-known and reliable men of God as Job, Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, as well as most of the minor prophets mention Christ's return in their writing. Not by the name Jesus, but by other names, Messiah, uh, the coming King, uh, God returning, different ways. But it is found in all of those books, even in the Old Testament. And so that brings us to part number one, what does the Bible teach? And I want to share uh, this they, uh, some more reasons for the pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, again and again, we are, we are confronted with when will the rapture happen in relation to the tribulation? Is it before? We call it pre-tribulation. Is it in the middle? That would be uh, um, the middle of the tribulation or post-tribulation is at the end. Or also another one that is called uh, pre-wrath rapture. So there are those different views. Um, I personally stick to the pre-tribulation view. There seem to be, for me, most of the indications. And it is true, they are just indications. But listen to a Bible passage about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15 through 17 says this, According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So that clearly describes the rapture. The Lord coming down, we going up, the trumpet of the Lord blowing. And uh, so those who are still alive, if we are still alive at that point, we are going up. Jesus comes with the believers that have gone before us. Another one is in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 53, where it says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. A mystery is something that was not revealed earlier. Now it is, by God, inspired uh, scripture, where it says, We will not all sleep, which means we will not all die, but we will all be changed 
in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. There's the trumpet again. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the per perishable must close if itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. The Bible tells us that when those uh, that have died before us will be raised, uh, they will be raised in their spiritual body. They now will get a spiritual body, and that will unite with them coming with Jesus in the air. So for that point on, resurrection, they will have again a spiritual body, uh, recognizable, and we will be able to uh, uh, recognize each other and, and, and talk to each other, uh, just as in our fleshly bo body. And it will be closed with immortality. It will be eternal. Is that not going to be great? This short life here is over and then eternity starts where we will live forever and ever with Jesus, the Holy Spirit and God. Oh, how I look forward to that. Now, here's Luke 17, 34 and 35. Jesus is saying this. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken, the other one left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, the other left. So again, clearly an indication of the rapture and what will happen. The believers will go. The unbelievers will have to stay. So... Here's the scripture that supports a pre-tribulation rapture in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, where we read, After this, I looked, this is John talking, John the Revelator. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet, there's again the trumpet, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. After what? After the seven churches, we just before in Revelation chapter 3 had uh, two and three had the seven churches described. The, the church age is over, and now he is saying to John, Come up here, which is also an indicator of the rapture immediately after the church age is over. And he says, I will show you what must take place after this, after the church age. At once I was in the spirit, remember we are going to be spirit human beings in heaven, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. That most likely is Jesus. Revelation chapter 4 verse 4, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. Who are they? Well, they are for sure the 12 apostles. The other 12 could be uh, other church leaders from that time. Or some uh, scholars think those are the 12 representatives of the 12 tribes of the Old Testament. So you would have both Old and New Testament believers up there together. Um, I'm not sure, but for sure it is the 12 uh, disciples that then became the 12 apostles. Now, let's go on. Verse chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. The 24 elders fell down before him, Jesus, who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns, that's important, they have crowns, they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Now why is that so important? How come they have crowns? When did they receive their crowns? Well, when will we receive our crowns? At the judgment seat of Christ. If you're familiar with the judgment seat of Christ, you know that we will receive rewards, which are crowns. 
So let me read that to you. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, verse 10, we read, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So a time will come when we are before God or before Christ, and there uh, he will look at our life, kind of like a, a movie, a movie going, you know, uh, showing uh, from beginning to end. What's good? What's bad? Where did we honor God? Where did we dishonor God? And in connection with this verse, I'll take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 11 through 15. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. We know that. He's our foundation, right? If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, that's one category, wood, hay, straw, that's the other category, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. A very important verse. So I always kind of picture Burger King. You know, they have this, uh, this uh, line that goes through the fire. And that's where the burgers are being uh, uh, boiled, broiled or, or barbecued. Anyways, that, that's going to be like, like our good and bad works, like our gold and silver and precious stones or hay and, and, and wood and stubble. So it goes through, the, the bad stuff burns up. On the other side, all you have is your gold and your silver and your precious stones. Everything else, gone, right? So we come through that, and then it says that even if there are no rewards, which are, by the way, our crowns that we will receive, even if there are no rewards, we will still be saved, even though only one escapes through the flame. So why? Because our salvation is not based on works, but on Jesus Christ and putting our faith and our trust in Him alone. So it has nothing to do with works. The works are important for the judgment seat of Christ, for the crowns that we can receive, but not for salvation. I'm so glad it states in there, they will still be safe because there are many, many, many Christians that have nothing to show for. And all their life they build stuff out of wood and, and hay and stubble. They, and it'll be burned up. There's nothing to show. No crown. They'll be ashamed. But it says they will still be saved. Even though only as one escaping through the flames. Their, their clothes will be smelling like burn. Anyways, that should be a tremendous encouragement for you and for me to build things out of gold and, uh, and precious stones and, um, uh, and uh, uh, silver. So how do we do that? Well, uh, we witness. We witness by our life. We witness by our, what we say, how we uh, act uh, to our relatives, to our friends, to our neighbors, to anybody that the Lord opens the door, we uh, we do something. We also another area would be we are helping. We're helping the needy. We are helping those who you know. The, the Jesus says a cold cup of water uh, you give to somebody that is thirsty. So there are many many ways how we can serve the Lord and build those precious stones, those crowns that we will receive. So with that, we'll go on to part number two. Thank mm -hmm. you.